Okay, welcome everyone to the latest of a series of talks sponsored by Indiana University's Project on Ethics, Values, and Technology, Developing Character for a Digital World. My name is Nathan Ensminger. I'm an associate professor in the uh, IU Luddy School of, of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering, and I'm the convener of this particular section of the larger grant project. I know that many of you who are here today have seen some of the other talks in, in the series, but for those of you who are new, let me just read a, a, a paragraph or two about the larger project. As artificial intelligence and big data management technologies increasingly influence everyday life, it is important that the next generation of entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and other professionals are thoughtful about the ethical implications of their work. And, and in pursuit of that goal, two of Indiana's major research universities are preparing to lead the way with support from Lilly Endowment Incorporated. Indiana University and Purdue University have both received planning grants to explore how their students and faculty can become more aware of and better prepared to address the ethical challenges presented by fast evolving digital technologies, especially in the context of artificial intelligence and big data management. And uh, we are kind of midway into the series of talks that are, are part of this project and we will post in the chat, uh, the website, we, we are recording everything. This is a very public uh, facing group of, of seminars. I am particularly excited given the, the scope of this or the challenge of this series to have Dr. Brand Knowles with us today. She is a senior lecturer in data science at Lancaster University. She's a qualitative researcher, a little different than the folks we've had in recently, who focuses on trust, privacy, and ethical considerations surrounding data and data systems. So she sits at the intersection of artificial intelligence and data science, and she studies different aspects of trust through ethnographic case studies and develops conceptual models of trust that help us uh, think not just about how to understand trust in the context of these systems, but how to design these systems better. And as, as, as part of a, a, a different project, uh, an NSF funded project on using artificial intelligence to promote healthcare among dementia patients in rural Indiana, we are seeing that trust is perhaps the key issue that, that we need to solve. And I'm, I'm particularly excited uh, to have someone who thinks about design. I will just mention among her other publications, uh, she has a recent conference paper, which has just one of those wonderful titles that intrigues and draws uh, you in for more. It's called 50 Shades of Gray in praise of a nuanced approach towards trustworthy design. So the way this series is going to work is uh, Dr. Knowles is going to present for about 35 minutes. Uh, we will have a question and answer session uh, immediately following. And I uh, will be uh, attempting to moderate questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. But you should also note that we're using Zoom's webinar format. And so you can, uh, there's a Q&A button at the very bottom and you can uh, ask questions there and those will be very prominent for us so, so that your questions will not get lost in chat. I should mention as well before Dr. Noel starts that we are also using the live transcript feature which is new to Zoom. And my understanding is that all of you can enable that or disable that uh, function in your own preferences. So, uh, but if you choose to enable it, you will have a, a live uh, a live transcript uh, 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 available to you uh, on your screens. And so without uh, further ado, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Knowles. All right, thank you so much. Um, now, bear with me while I do the, the faffing around with the getting my slides going. Um, I assume everyone can see that. Alrighty. Um, so 
first of all, thank you so much for this invitation to speak to you. Um, I had a look at, at the series and some of the other talks and I'm, I'm honored to be included in that list. Um, so uh, Nathan mentioned some of this, but you know, I thought I'd just start by telling you a, a bit about my background. Um, so I'm, I'm based in the Data Science Institute at Lancaster University. Um, I'm not a data scientist. I don't consider myself a data scientist. Um, I was brought in because um, it was becoming clear that trust in data and data systems was becoming a hot topic and they needed a resident trust expert and, and that's me. Um, so I'm a social scientist by background. Um, so, you know, as Nathan mentioned, I broadly research um, things like how to design trustworthy and trusted systems, um, systems that foster trust between stakeholders and collaborators, um, and also understanding people's attitudes to technologies, um, and increasingly um, that's artificial intelligence, um, the focus of my work. Um, so I'm particularly interested in distrust and how it intersects with ethical dimensions of, of technologies and their social impacts. Um, so I've done work, for instance, on older adults' distrust of digital technologies. Um, and actually, there are some interesting parallels between older adults' distrust of digital technologies and public distrust of artificial intelligence. Um, so, for example, in contrast to more technically expert groups, you might say, um, distrust in both of these cases has actually has little to do with the technical features of the technology, and it has everything to do with a moral opposition to the uses and impacts of these technologies on society. And in both cases as well, technology adoption is seen as a reason to focus on trust. Um, but in fact, what we find is that trust is not determinative of adoption. So technologies are adopted all the time without us necessarily trusting them. And uh, it's important to remember that adoption is not necessarily an endorsement that the person trusts the technology. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about some recently published work I did in collaboration with John Richards at IBM. Um, so he's part of the team developing IBM's suite of um, AI governance tools, and that includes AI fact sheets. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with fact sheets, they capture information related to um, safety and performance testing an AI system has undergone, uh, details of the training and training data, and intended use cases of the algorithms. So fact sheets are just one amongst a kind of a new species that we're seeing of AI documentation that's emerged in recent years, um, which attempts to address some of the ethical and legal concerns and general social impacts of AI systems. Um, so when I talk later about AI documentation, this is what I'm talking about. Um, and if I, if I say we in this talk, I'm referring to John and I. I thought it was only fair I put his picture up there. Um, so we wrote this paper um, because we thought there was something really wrong with how people talk about public trust in AI. Um, so what's wrong with it? Um, so what's the common narrative to begin with? Um, the narrative is that AI offers this enormous opportunity for a positive social impact across any number of problem areas, um, that it can directly improve our daily lives. And at the same time, it's, it's also seen as this key driver of economic growth. So governments are keen to promote AI research and development through these major investments. Um, but the one thing that can stop us from unleashing this potential and realizing all these benefits is a lack of trust. Um, that's the argument, or that's the reason why trust in AI is seen as important, um, because distrust is this barrier to um, widespread uptake of the technology. So it's the justification for AI, uh, trusted AI research. Um, the problem is it doesn't work as a justification. Um, so if AI adoption is all that we care about, then we actually really don't need to bother worrying about trust or trustworthiness. Um, and the reason is because the public doesn't have meaningful choice. They will adopt AI, if you can even call it adoption, um, in many cases, despite uh, distrusting it. Um, and that's because AI is increasingly in everything. Um, so remember, AI doesn't, doesn't offer complete solutions. It offers intelligent components of systems. Um, and we're entering what we might describe as an age of pervasive AI. 
So very soon, all technologies will have some element of AI and every decision will be informed by AI. So AI is embedded and it's everywhere. That's this pervasive AI state we're in. So when we say that trust is important for adoption, um, do we really imagine that the public has any kind of agency? I mean, what would it even mean for someone to reject AI? Um, this is nonsensical. Um, people are subject to AI, uh, often even without awareness that they're encountering it. So the key motivation for this paper that we wrote was that scholarship on trust in AI, which has historically been interested in contexts where an expert user is forming a trust relationship with a single known AI system, it doesn't actually work for the context of pervasive AI. Um, specifically, past work in this space has assumed that interpersonal trust models apply when these in fact don't scale to the context of pervasive AI. So I'll of course explain this in more detail, um, but this was the light bulb moment for us and the reason we set about to reimagine public trust in AI. Um, so in my talks, I like to give people the punchline up, right up front, um, possibly assuming I might lose you at any minute. Um, so here are some of the key points to take away from the talk. Um, the first is that in contrast to the arguments I just described on the previous slide, um, what you might call this instrumental argument for the importance of trust in AI, the only argument for focusing on public trust in AI that makes sense is one that springs from a moral basis. Um, and by that, I mean what it feels like and what it means to individuals to be surrounded by technology that they fundamentally don't or can't or even shouldn't trust. Um, this isn't about getting the public comfortable enough with AI to use it. It's about making AI that's worthy of trust because we don't want a world in which AIs are everywhere and we don't feel comfortable surrounded by them. The second distinction to understand is that public trust in AI isn't about, and actually in fact can't be about, um, trust in the various different AIs that the public encounters in their world. That reasoning, so deciding whether a particular AI system is trustworthy is something that an expert might be able to undertake. Um, for example, when it comes to figuring out how much to rely on an AI-based recommendation, or whether to purchase an AI component for a system, um, but it really doesn't scale to the reality of a world in which AI is pervasive. The only kind of trust that scales to this context is a type of trust called institutional trust. So this means that when people trust or distrust AI, this thing called AI, they're trusting or distrusting in what I've come to call AI as an institution. In other words, AI as um, an abstraction, which on the whole either can or cannot be assumed to be assumed to be trustworthy. And this leads to the next point, which is that common approaches to the challenge of fostering trust in, trust in AI rely on individuals being able to evaluate and determine the trustworthiness of particular AIs. Um, and so a lot of solutions that we see are geared towards helping end users understand the trustworthiness of these individual AIs. Um, and the public quite simply doesn't have the ability to do this. Um, even if someone is technically able, which let's face it is gonna be pretty rare, um, there are simply too many AI-based systems that we encounter in our lives in this pervasive context, right? Um, we already don't have time to read terms and conditions. We already um, don't understand cookies it's a really big ask to expect members of the public to develop trust in AIs by committing the time and effort to understand how each of these different AIs work. Now, this is a bit of a sidebar. Um, I've heard a lot of well-meaning people say that we need to equip all citizens with AI literacy skills because they need to be able to make informed decisions in their use of AI and know how to protect themselves. Um, this really annoys me. Um, as I mentioned, I've done quite a bit of research on older adults' use of digital technologies, um, and we already know that there's this digital divide, right? So it's not just between young and old, but between the haves and the have-nots. Um, I've done some work around um, children's safety um, and digital technologies, so we know that parents struggle to understand their children's data privacy. 
And then we're saying that it's the responsibility of individuals to protect themselves from AI. Um, surely this is backwards. We should have mechanisms that protect people from harm by default. Um, so as important as it is for AI to be explainable to someone, um, my argument is that that someone is not the public. Um, things like fairness, robustness, and explainability, um, these pertain to the trustworthiness of AI systems, but on their own, don't actually promote public trust in AI. Um, later, I'll explain that they do have a key role to play. It's just that we should assume the relevant audience to be regulators and not the public. Um, so in the absence of something which offers a guarantee that someone can reasonably trust the AIs that pervade their world uh, without even having to think about it, then we can't expect the public's trust in AI to increase. So by the end of this talk, I'll offer um, a sketch of a means of promoting public trust in AI, um, but we're only able to see this once we understand the institutional nature of public trust and distrust in AI. Um, right. So before I get to that, I need to explain and then pick apart the way we typically approach trust in AI. Um, if you examine the trusted AI literature, you'll notice that there's this particular orientation to trust, and specifically this idea that trust arises through a process of rationally assessing evidence of trustworthiness. And so distrust, therefore, is either um, a response to having determined something is untrustworthy or not having access to enough evidence of trustworthiness. Um, in general, the literature assumes that the AI in question is trustworthy, but that the end user isn't able to understand this and needs to be shown more evidence of trustworthiness. Um, this is the basic premise underlying all of explainable AI. Um, this, this is the same information deficit model that we see in science communication. Um, now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this way of understanding trust. Um, this is rooted in the famous uh, ability benevolence integrity or ABI model, um, some of you might be familiar with. Um, and this helps explain how people come to trust in organizational contexts. Um, so this is a diagram from a paper by uh, Mayor Davis and Shurman. It's been cited over 22,500 times. Um, so obviously it's had a profound influence on scholarship on trust. Um, people have applied it to a whole range of trust contexts and, and relationships. And for what it's worth, I've used it before as well for certain contexts. So I'm not against this model in principle. Um, so according to this model, there are several stages along the journey to trusting. Um, the first is the belief stage. So a person forms a belief by making an initial assessment of the trustworthiness of a given entity, whoever or, or whatever that is, based on available evidence of their ability, benevolence, and integrity. So if we're talking about um, people working together in an organizational context, for example, um, and say someone wants to know if they can rely on another person to deliver a piece of work, then they'll want to know certain things. So they'll want to know, does this person have the necessary skills to be able to deliver this work? That's ability. They'll want to know if this person is generally well-meaning. So that's benevolence. And they'll want to know that this is a person who strives for consistency between their intentions and actions, and that's integrity. Um, so altogether, this ABI sense check stage is about using what you know about this person to make an initial assessment of whether a person is capable of delivering against expectations, um, that they intend to do so, and that they adhere to principles in a consistent way that makes it likely that they'll do so. Um, so having formed a trust belief, a person is thought to engage in a process of reflecting on how much risk they take on by trusting this entity. Um, so they consider what harms might come from them trusting someone who then fails to meet their expectations. And then based on this calculation, the person makes um, a sort of tentative decision to trust or not trust. Often trust is defined as making oneself vulnerable to risk. Um, so you never know for sure whether this 
person or a thing will perform as expected and whether you'll suffer harm from trusting them, but you're taking this calculated risk in trusting. Um, all trust is subject to review, however, and the idea is that you might trust someone, but then you continue continually monitor whether this person is behaving according to your predictions of their behavior. And if someone fails to meet your expectations, then you lose trust in them. If they carry on acting as predicted, um, your trust becomes more solidified. So this diagram helps convey just how much cognition is entailed in interpersonal trust formation. Um, so you've got to gather and assess evidence to form an initial hypothesis about anticipated outcomes and then monitor outcomes and compare them against this assumption. You have to be able to imagine and formulate a sense of how risky it would be to assume this person or thing will continue to act in line with your understanding of their um, previous pattern of behavior. <clears throat> And then even after trusting your work isn't done, you still need to evaluate whether this was sensible or not, and then adjust your starting hypothesis. Um, so as I said, this model is um, it's pretty well accepted. It's, it's really established. Um, and we have imported this thinking uh, into trusted AI research without really um, questioning it or thinking about what it means. Um, so trusted AI has largely focused on developing tools to provide access to indicators of trustworthiness. So to help users of AI systems know how to calibrate their initial perception. So a lot of the work in this space is about trying to develop resources for decision makers, um, particularly those that are in high stakes decision making contexts. Um, who need to understand the processes that produce the algorithmic outputs they depend on. And this model sort of makes sense here. Um, you've got an AI system that's introduced into a workflow almost as a stand-in for a person. Um, and this person's job is to recommend that you do something or not. Um, you need to know whether to trust this person, this person in quotes, right? Um, I think there are some weirdnesses when it comes to assessing the, the benevolence um, and integrity of a, a computer or an algorithm, um, but I can at least understand why this trust model has been assumed relevant for this context. Now, um, but does it make sense when it comes to public trust in AI? Um, now is probably a good time to define what I mean by public. Um, so I rather like the phrasing used in the paper. Um, so by the public, we mean average, relatively non-technical citizens, individuals who encounter AI as an abstruse component of their digital milieu. So is this person able to form trust through this process described on the previous slide? What would they need to be able to do so? Um, they'd need to be able to understand something about what the AI's purpose is, um, what it's designed to do in order to formulate a meaningful prediction of whether um, it thinks the, the AI is likely to do this according to their expectations. Um, in fact, they need to be able to form that expectation. So drawing from some evidence of trustworthiness. And for this context, this would clearly be technical evidence pertaining to some underlying functionality. Um, they would need to understand something about whether the AI is capable of doing the job it's been designed to do, um, or perhaps more importantly, how it's been designed and how that might affect its reliability in a specific context. And they need to be able to monitor whether their prediction is correct. Um, well, an important characteristic of AI is that it really isn't visible in ways that make it easy to understand what effect it's having in the world. Um, and of course, the public would also need to be able to understand what the relevant risks would be when interacting with an AI. So how can a member of the public do this when we know that experts struggle to envisage potential risks from AI systems? So when we're talking about members of the public, we're talking about individuals who can be characterized as um, lacking in the relevant skill set to deeply understand how AI models function or to reasonably assess evidence of trustworthiness. 
Um, they're lacking in a particular reason to focus on a given AI at hand. So they encounter an AI component within a system that's otherwise the focus of their interaction. They're not focusing on the AI itself. Um, they're lacking in any real immediate need to determine whether an AI can be trusted. I mean, what do they care? Um, often, even that's not clear, particularly when they aren't aware that they're even interacting with an AI. Um, and they're lacking in knowledge needed to fully articulate potential risks that might result from interacting with an AI. Um, now, to be clear, I believe that this definition applies to everyone most of the time. We are all the public, um, even people in this group today who probably know a lot more than the average Joe about AI. It's only when someone is made explicitly aware of their interactions with a particular AI or when they need to use an AI system as part of their workflow um, that I would say that this definition and these characteristics maybe don't apply. Um, so for the public, as I've described it, let's see if this ABI model makes sense. Um, do we think they form a trust belief through rationally assessing the ability, benevolence, and integrity of an AI system, and then continually monitoring whether the system behaves predictably? Um, this would be a lot to ask of any member of the public with respect to any individual AI, but it's completely ludicrous in a world of pervasive AI particularly when the public, as I said, has already faces difficulties even recognizing when they're interacting with AI. Um, critically though, I don't think predictability has much to do with the public's concerns around AI. This is sort of an irrelevance here. Um, also, do we think they form a trust decision by weighing risks associated with trusting the AI system? Um, Assessing, assessing risk as it relates to AI is, as I said, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and actually it's quite different to the kinds of scenarios where someone's considering whether they can rely on someone or something. Um, that's about predicting behavior. Um, I think risk is possibly too simplistic for the context of trust in AI anyway. So risk that comes from AI um, it's not individuated. These harms are dispersed across society and a person might not be singularly concerned with their own individual risk. Um, risks also emerge not necessarily from the AI itself, but from its application uh, and even from its interaction with, with other AIs. Um, but it's also not as if a member of the public is deciding whether an AI will behave predictably. Um, that might be important to the person developing the AI, um, but it's more about what effects the AI uh, has even when it's behaving as designed. Um, there's, there's no reason to assume AI doesn't behave as it's been designed to do. That's what algorithms do. It's just not entirely clear that deliberations about whether AI is trustworthy in the big picture sense, when we talk about trusting or distrusting AI, um, lend themselves to decisions premised in risk. Um, and do we think that the public is capable of taking an action on the basis of trust? Um, in this context, this action stage would presumably mean adopting the AI in question, according to that narrative I mentioned at the start. Um, but as I explained, uh, the public doesn't have meaningful choice to adopt or reject AI. The, the important point to make here is that the ability to reject an untrustworthy party helps encourage the trustee to be more trustworthy. Um, so this action stage is considered a fundamental requirement of accountability, and I just don't believe the public can take action in this way. Um, and so this is so important, at least to me, um, because the prevailing narrative, as I mentioned at the start, is that if the public doesn't trust AI, then they'll reject it. And therefore, there are these powerful market forces which work to ensure that the AI is trustworthy. So companies will work hard to ensure that customers have a good reason to trust them. Uh, I'm sort of picking on Microsoft here, but all the big companies are trying to sell themselves as doing responsible or, or ethical AI. Um, but without this action stage, um, these market forces don't have any real weight or significance. Um, 
So this is now personal opinion, but I believe it's in the interest of big tech to sell us this line that they'll self-regulate because they'll have this intrinsic drive for reputational preservation. Um, that means that we can assume they won't do anything that would reduce the public's trust in the AIs they develop or, and deploy. Um, now, this argument is fundamentally broken. Um, do we really trust the apps and services we use or do we have no choice? So again, this is a bit of a sidebar, right? But I think this is important. If we accept this framing, then it means that when people adopt AI, it can be viewed as an endorsement of trustworthiness, that the AI is fine. We don't need to change anything about AI for it to be acceptable to the public. Um, but the truth is that people may even despise AI. They might hate everything it stands for and everything it's doing to society, but there just isn't any realistic way to avoid it. So if you take one thing away, please understand that this narrative being pushed about public trust in AI is wrong, um, but possibly for a reason. So it serves a useful purpose in that it insulates big tech from outside regulation. So you can maybe guess where I'm heading with this. Um, so in summary, um, not the end of the talk, but a, a midpoint summary, um, the belief stage presumes expertise required to meaningfully assess trustworthiness, which the public just doesn't have. Um, the decision stage presumes the ability to gauge associated risks in a way that the public isn't capable of but also in ways that don't really speak to the complex ethical matters at stake when it comes to trust or distrust of AI. And the action stage presumes a choice to accept the risk or not, um, and that's a choice that the public doesn't have. So if the public is severely limited in their ability to process trust in AI at each of these different stages, then we need a new model that explains better how the public processes trust and therefore how trust in AI can be fostered. So let's try an analogy. Um, take your mind back to when you last boarded an airplane, if you can. Um, do you trust that plane? Um, well, would you like to see the maintenance logs for the engines? Would you like to see at each and every point that the pilots have performed their pre-flight checks. Um, I'm guessing that instead you sort of trust that the, you trust the airplane because you're confident in the knowledge that um, aviation is highly regulated, it's comparatively safe, and any breach of safety protocols anywhere in the life cycle, design, construction, test, monitoring, maintenance, these are all visibly sanctioned. Um, so this is a fantastically ingenious shortcut that we've had to develop out of a necessity in socially complex societies where one-to-one -one trust formation just doesn't scale and where more specialized expertise is needed to evaluate trustworthiness. So we don't trust the individual, we trust the system. And specifically, we trust the system, um, in this example, the aviation sector, uh, we trust that, that it has appropriate mechanisms for ensuring trustworthiness. So as long as that system works, we don't have to worry about the trustworthiness of the individual flight. Um, so this kind of trust is called institutional trust, and it's something that has been studied as a characteristic of late modern societies. Uh, so in other words, I'm not inventing a new kind of trust here. This type of trust is known and studied in uh, sociology and psychology. Um, and it's something we're exceptionally comfortable with in our daily lives. So go to the supermarket. Are you assessing whether each and every item on the shelves can be trusted? Or are you trusting in systems that regulate food and other consumer products? So in the paper, we apply a a basic formulation of institutional trust to the context of public trust in AI. And we call this, um, this kind of trust in AI as an institution. And um, this formulation sees the system or the institution as being um, what's called mediated through three dimensions of structure. 
which if they're working correctly, provide the rules that the institution aims to uphold and the means of enforcing those rules so that the institution and its individual members can be trusted. So apologies, but this requires us to briefly dip into some heavy sociology. Um, hopefully it'll be worth it. So the signification dimension refers to the language of symbols and um, symbolic actions that make sense in the context of a given institution. So for example, we've come to understand that a person wearing a white coat in a hospital is a doctor. Um, legitimation provides norms and values, and these are reinforced and made visible through sanctioning members of the institution who violate these expectations. Domination refers to the ways that power can be applied within the institution. Um, agents are empowered through various resources, which will become important in a minute. So according to this formulation, trust arises through a perception of coherence between these dimensions. So in other words, the system is capable of impelling individuals to conform to various norms, which are commonly understood through a shared language. So how do outsiders gauge whether an institution is functioning effectively in this way? Um, this is through something called face work. Um, the actions of members of the institution provide clues. For example, if a company flaunts their disregard of consumer safety and gets away with it, this signals an institutional failure to ensure trustworthiness. So just to be clear, um, a company like IBM would be a member of this institution, as we're calling it. And this means that whether or not um, whether or not IBM in, intends to, um, they act as a representative of this institution. So if IBM develops AI that ends up harming people, this not only causes reputational damage to IBM, but it leads to a sense that IBM isn't accountable to a system of rules and regulations that's designed to um, effectively prevent harm. And therefore other companies presumably aren't either. Um, and therefore, why should anyone trust AI? So organizations have an important role to play in fostering public trust in that they are um, the access points to this institution. They help us see whether it functions or not based on their behavior. Um, so if the public can only meaningfully relate to AI as an institution, then we have to consider how these individual dimensions can be developed and supported, um, as well as how they might work together coherently. So with regards to this signification dimension, there are some tricky questions about how we indicate and recognize trustworthy AI, and also how specific features of AI map to various social harms or risks. Um, and we need to develop this language, in other words. For legitimation, there are important questions about what is the normative culture of AI? So what does the pattern of sanctions tell us about what rules AI is playing by? Um, who's developing the norms and values that AI ex is expected to live up to? But also, do they map to public values, um, you know, what the public demands of AI? Uh, and as for domination, do we have laws? Are they enforceable? Who's supposed to apply sanctions against AI that violates expectations? And finally, um, to whom are AIs ultimately accountable? So all of this really boils down to the need to develop a robust regulatory ecosystem, which provides some guarantee that the public is protected from harmful consequences of AI. So a quick recap. Um, I've shown that public trust in AI is different from interpersonal trust or even expert trust in AI, and the relevant type of trust is instead institutional trust. Um, this is critical for understanding that fostering public trust in AI isn't simply a case of providing end users with better explanations. Um, in fact, in the paper, we argue that explainable AI has no role in fostering public trust in AI and would indeed reduce trust insofar as it signals that there are no institutional guarantees 
and that individuals are responsible for making informed choices. Um, instead, we need to develop a robust uh, regulatory ecosystem. And so I'll turn now to the third contribution, which is the pivotal role of AI documentation in enabling this ecosystem. All right, so remember, one of the characteristics of an institution which functions in ways that foster trust in its members is that it has a means of sanctioning members who don't meet certain standards. So in order to be trusted, AI as an institution would need to develop a means of systematically weeding out AIs that are deemed harmful or risky so that what remains is, is trustworthy. Um, there have, of course, been calls for AI-specific legislation, but for this legislation to have teeth, as the saying goes, then we first need something to chew on. In other words, we would need to develop resources that empower these agents to sanction untrustworthy AI. Um, and this would imply the need for some form of documentation, which can be interpreted by some skilled agents. Um, of course, you know, this isn't actually what AI documentation is currently designed for. I mentioned IBM fact sheets. Um, well, they're designed to document compliance with IBM's own ethical standards um, or convey relevant information to someone purchasing or implementing AI components. Um, but if this argument holds so far, then we would need to explore how to adapt to AI documentation to be able to account for trustworthiness to regulators and independent auditors. Um, so there's important work to do in developing a shared language for communicating facts about AIs, which can be assessed consistently by these auditors. Um, and we also, over time, we might expect to develop a sort of case law regarding past decisions about AI systems, which can be referred to internally within this documentation, perhaps, that that becomes part of the language. Um, and these dimensions, these components would need to co-evolve over time. Um, the institution needs to develop an understanding of trustworthiness first, um, and this needs to be specified formally, which then allows for these norms to be enforced. Um, and finally, there are certain mechanisms which visibly promote or give clues to the trustworthiness of AIs, and all of these iterations need to grow, are needed to grow public trust in AI, sorry. All right, so some high level takeaways. Um, I'm certain that the public is incapable of determining the trustworthiness of individual AIs, no matter what we design for them, um, but we don't need them to do this. It's not their responsibility to keep AI honest. So the public doesn't need to know how an AI works in order to trust it. They just need to know that someone or somebody within, uh, with the necessary skill set is examining AI and has the authority to meet out sanctions appropriately. And AI documentation is key. Um, but if we fail to recognize the previous two points, then there's a good chance that the future of AI documentation becomes yet another um, terms and conditions style consent mechanism. Um, so something that no one really reads or understands. Um, so we need to reimagine AI documentation in ways that actually empower auditors to assess trustworthiness. So how we design documentation so that it's suitable for these purposes is what I'm hoping to work on next. Um, finally, a regulatory ecosystem is the only way that AI will be accountable to the public thereby earning public trust. I started by saying that the idea that trust in AI is necessary for adoption doesn't make sense. Um, well, it also depoliticizes really important moral issues surrounding AI, uh, making it seem as though trustworthiness is secondary to whether consumers can be convinced or even tricked to adopt it. AI has material consequences in our world which affect real people. We have to remember that. Um, and we need genuine accountability to ensure that the
the AI that pervades our world is actually helping to make that world better. So that's AI that the public ought to trust. Um, that's it. Um, thank you so much for listening. I've put a link to two papers. Um, the, the top one is the one I was mainly talking about today. I also briefly mentioned at the start some work I've done on, on older adults. Um, distrust of digital technology. So I thought I'd put that link as well. Um, and Nathan mentioned another another talk, which was led by my, um, the lead author was my PhD student, but yes, it does have a provocative title. You're, you're welcome to check that one out as well. Um, I'm happy to, to take any questions now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bran. And uh, uh, we have been monitoring the chat. We've got a couple questions. Uh, that, that are in the Q&A. Uh, just before we get started with questions, just a reminder to all of our participants that this, like the other talks, are recorded and will be available in, in a kind of archive. Part of the, the Lilly Endowment's goal is to develop a kind of infrastructure for resources on this. Uh, I have so many questions. Uh, this <laughs> was a very challenging talk for me in the best possible way. I, I realize how uh, naive my own model of trust was that that we were using in, in some of our projects. Uh, but there's some great questions that are coming in and I would encourage those of you on the line to um, to post your questions in either the chat uh, or the Q&A. The first one is really, really interesting. Uh, this is from Ashton. Are there known examples of AI that have been deemed as untrustworthy? Oh, so there's there's good work going on by the partnership on AI right now, um, and they are, you know, there there's, I think there's over a hundred um, companies involved in that partnership, and they're trying to put together an incident database, hmm. um, which is basically incidents of untrustworthy AI. Um, so that's a starting place. Um, and actually, I think that's publicly available. So if you wanted to search for that, then I'm, I think there's a link to the, the beginnings of that effort. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting parallel to kind of the way engineering ethics works and the way it deals with failure, uh, but it, it tends to be anecdotal rather than systematic. This kind of questions of opaqueness come up in a variety of different ways, including explainable AI. Um, maybe we'll come back to that. But again, some good questions coming in uh, from Chris. Who will regulate AI as a trusted institution? Uh, no industry has ever regulated themselves effectively. Look at the auto industry, fossil fuels, tobacco, et cetera. Um, we have the FAA, for example, looking over airline safety, but you know it does seem that industries themselves, as opposed to governments, aren't always an effective mechanism. Yeah, um, that's probably fair. I mean, I think so. Uh, we do have an example, an interesting example, with um, the financial sector now, where um, so they, there's all sorts of applications for AI uh, when it comes to finance. Well, um, the financial sector itself has said, um, you can't have machine learning algorithms here because we just mm. don't understand what they're doing well enough. You haven't been able to provide enough documentation to make us feel comfortable applying it to, to finance. Um, so, they, so they're relegated now to just rule-based AI um, for finance. And I, I imagine similar, um, uh, sector-based regulation um, happening. So I don't know, the justice, uh, you know, applications of AI in, in the justice, justice system would need to be regulated by people who look out for the justice system, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, I don't think that um, a top-down sort of holistic um, regulation of AI even quite makes sense because you need to understand the sector applications anyway. Um, but you need people who can bridge that those worlds. They need to understand the, the application domain and they need to be technically pretty with it to understand what the AI is doing. But it's, it's going to be challenging for sure. I think we need to help as much as we can by providing um, helpful documentation. Yeah. Purpose. Well, you know, this, maybe I'll just interject one of, one of my questions, which that has to do with explainable AI, but I guess the twist on the question is kind of 
who needs to be explained to? So I, I first started working on kind of AI in the context of medical diagnosis, maybe 20 years ago. And at that point, the systems worked from a certain statistically measurable point of view, but they weren't being adopted. And, and you pointed out, I think quite rightly, that the public often doesn't have any choice, particularly in medicine, or at least in the United States, about, about that. But they have this kind of several several layers of trusted intermediary. And you talked at the big level, right? That the airline system is a system that is trustworthy. And so yeah. therefore we don't question the credentials of our pilot. Yeah. But for physicians, it's a little closer to the ground, right? Because we do evaluate trust via our mm -hmm. physicians. Mm -hmm. And medicine's of course complicated because there's not just trust, there's also legal liability, there are, there's ethics, there are a whole bunch of things going on. But in some ways, in that example, the people who need to trust the AI are physicians, not patients. As you point out, patients don't choose. And I guess, I'm, I, so I'm asking, where, where does that kind of intermediary fit in your model? Because they are informed and capable, or at least responsible for making decisions about trustworthiness, in a different way, and yet in other ways are, are not prepared at all because they're physicians, not computer scientists. Um, yeah. Do you get the question buried I, in that? I long? do, yeah. and I, I suspect that in future iterations of this of this framework, there might be this intermediary filter where actually, in a particular instance, the public is is um, is filtering their trust in the institution through someone else that they trust, mm. um, and I think that that's that's possibly true. Um, uh, and to the extent that, that, a you know, a doctor physician needs to know how the AI is working, then, then they need to have access to that information. So they need to be able to, there does need to be some role for explanation. Um, I guess the, the point is that we just rely on this kind of lazy assumption that transparency e will lead to trust. And usually it just confounds people. So you throw lots of stuff at them and they're just like, oh, I give up, right? That's not trust. That's just like, fine, <laughs> you know? Um, and um, if we really wanted, if we really cared about why it matters to be able to trust these things, um, why it matters that the public right now doesn't trust AI particularly, um, then we need to kind of think about how we speak to their concerns. Um, and they need to have some confidence that somebody is doing the hard work here, that it's not all on their shoulders, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I'm, the next question comes from Sarah, and I'm going to kind of interpret it a little bit because she's added an addendum. But um, so I work in an unregulated in industry currently in user design, and uh, it sounds like uh, she's working in kind of online classified cars, jobs, property, and e-commerce marketplaces. Um, so unregulated e-commerce, uh, and I want to lead the conversation, I'm, and I'm assuming here kind of either within the firm or within the industry, we haven't employed a lot of AI yet, and we want to inform a point of view that our organization can use uh, as a kind of guiding light uh, for us to uh, weave trust into the way that we develop AI. And, and she asked, do you have any guidance or insight into how they might approach this topic? Um, I mean, there's, there's no end of sort of principles that have been published out there and there's not no real great difference between all of them. There's like 80 something different, um, you know, lists of principles you could ad adhere to the, 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 the tricky part is the implementation of these principles. So if you wanted to start with the principles, that's a good starting point. Um, I think we have to get a lot better at, um, understanding how, implementation um, sort of um, affects risk or turns into risk, right, in the real world. Um, and um, there are uh, impact assessments that you can do. Algorithmic impact assessments are a new tool that you can use. Um, these are becoming popular. There's a lot of work in that space. Um, so you can kind of leverage that to begin a conversation around what impacts you're having. Um, but you know, having having principles is a good starting point, but it doesn't get you particularly far. You need to kind of work through these through these things um, 
be able to imagine what the risks are. And as I say, there are some tools to help with that. Thank you. So uh, Mar Hicks has a, a question that speaks back to um, your point about Microsoft. And the, I apologize to Microsoft, by the way. It's <laughs> well, so, standing for all, all big tech. That's right. So we're going to, she's going to pick on Google, but, okay, um, but, <laughs> but the, the kind of context was about um, the way in which uh, actors in this industry have really picked up on the language of AI ethics, are trying to get in front of yeah. these issues. And so Amar um, asked about uh, your thoughts on Google's recent firings of Dr. Gabriel and Dr. Mitchell. Um, and uh, more generally then about the kind of role of whistleblowers in the self or corporate regulatory processes. And uh, yeah, so just kind of generally, do you think this is, uh, what does this signify? What are, is this a positive development? What function do those, those people play? Um, so I have been following this. Um, so my read of this situation is that you know, people are really angry in this case. So why are they so angry? These are just two people at Google. Um, and the reason is because it just demonstrates that this was all, that there's nothing holding these companies to what they say, right? So they say they, you know, they have these, this um, Google AI ethics group, Microsoft has a group, IBM has a group, they've all got these ethics groups. When it comes down to making decisions that are, um, that go against their bottom line or, you know, talking about the ethics, which may, you know, eventually impacts their bottom line or anything that embarrasses them. Um, then just kidding, you know, we know we actually have the power here. You thought for a second that you were in control. We have the power. And I think it's that it just, it just laid bare this sort of naked power asymmetry that really upset people because you're kind of, you're kind of resting all your hopes and dreams on these companies having, um, being these benevolent actors. You're like, oh, I really, really hope that they want to make like the most wonderful world because they, we know they hold all the power. And when we start to doubt that, when we have some in indication that maybe, maybe they might not um, live or walk the walk, right? Um, then it's, that's very worrying to us because then you start to realize, well, there's nothing preventing them from doing effectively whatever they wanted. Um, so that's my interpretation there. I mean, when it comes to whistleblowers, um, it would be wonderful if we developed some sort of mechanisms that protected them. I mean, currently there are, I think when you work for a big company, um, you have to sign um, various, you know, a contract that says things like you can't disclose things that would make us look bad <laughs> effectively, right? Um, and when it comes to, to AI, um, there are real harms in play. Um, it's important that we're able to expose them. Um, I don't know why normal kind of whistleblowing practice uh, laws and, and approaches can't be applied to the corporate um, realm as well. They ought to be. Are you hopeful at all that this is a step towards the realization that there needs to be some equivalent to the FAA, some FAAI <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would 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 sit outside of corporations, or is that just wishful thinking again? I mean, I think the dialogue now is more the the dialogue that's happening is how, what kind of role should uh, these big companies have in hmm. AI research in scholarship. Um, that maybe those two should be should be separated. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that that gets us far enough into what you're talking about, but that seems to be where we're, where the conversation's starting now. Perhaps it will snowball. Um, we'll have to see. I've got my eye on it though. Yeah. So uh, Sarah asked a kind of follow-up question, which I think is really interesting in relationship to the ABI model that you outlined mm -hmm. at the beginning of your talk. Where does rebuilding trust fit in that model, right? So what could Google do to compensate for this recent PR disaster? Um, so uh, an unfortunate thing about trust is that it's, um, it's very 
easy to lose and it's hard to gain. And once you've lost it, there are these sort of catastrophic losses of trust that are hard to, to get back. You have to really work and work and work at it. Um, I, I, I kind of actually think that in this case, you know, it, in the worlds that, in the circles that we run in, we have our eye on this. I don't know how much the general public mm. is kind of watching the the drama, this new computing world drama of a firing of somebody in the AI um, ethics group at Google. Um, but um, if there were trust to rebuild, if that was something that, if there was a catastrophic loss of trust in Google, um, I think we we face an existential crisis because what are you going to do? Mm. I mean, I, I, what? How how do we function, <laughs> right? Right? Um, right. And I don't know if that awakening is something that we're able to handle. And and I think sometimes when you face things like that, you you tend to you just shut down. You, you're like, yeah. I don't want to see it, right? You put the blinkers on. So I don't know. This is a this is a special and different case. Um, normally you just have to, um, with the ABI model in, in normal context, you just have to provide, provide key evidence of trustworthiness on a consistent basis. Um, just continue, 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 and remind people that you're trustworthy. This is different though, I think. Yeah. Well, that's a, a, a good point at, at which to end this smart and very provocative talk. I thank you for all of you, uh, all of our participants who've, who've joined us. Um, again, the recording will be available and presumably now the live transcript will be available as well. So I'm going to uh, welcome you again to visit the Dig Ethics website to keep an eye on future talks. And this AI ethics session section is only one of six sections on a variety of ethics issues related to the digital world. So thank you again. Thank you so much.